As uh, Dean of the Faculty, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the FSD Science Week. Um, as Nick has explained, we had to make a switch this year from Michaelmas to Lent term as a result of COVID-19. And rather than running the usual annual one day conference, we decided to instead run a whole science week. And uh, to be honest, that's a bit of an experiment. So uh, I wish everybody well with it. And uh, I know that Nick and uh, Jan in particular have put a huge amount of effort into it. So um, I wish everybody well with it. Um, I'm looking forward to every, every minute of it uh, over, over the period of this week. So turning to our keynote speaker, uh, thanks very much to uh, David. Uh, very, mu very much welcome. Um, I'm genuinely delighted to be able to introduce David uh, to kickstart our FSD Science Week. Uh, we've been previously able to attract a very uh, high profile set of individuals to Lancaster through the FSD Annual Conference, and this year is no exception. Uh, Professor David Halpin is the Chief Executive of the Behavioral Insights Team popularly known as the Nudge Unit, which was spun out from the Cabinet Office, and David has led the team since its inception in 2010, uh, recently celebrating uh, its 10, 10th anniversary. Prior to that, David was the first research director of the Institute for Government, and between 2001 and 2007, he was a chief analyst of the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Uh, and David was also appointed as the What Works National Advisor in July 2013. He supports the What Works Network and leads efforts to improve the use of evidence across government. Uh, beyond that, David is also one of the 56 individuals contributing to SAGE uh, presently in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, focusing, for example, on behavioural changes such as increased uh, hand washing. Uh, before entering government, David held tenure at Cambridge and posts at Oxford and Harvard. And in 2016, David was elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, David's output has been prolific. Uh, David has written several books and papers on areas relating to behavioral insights and well-being, including Social Capital in 2005, The Hidden Wealth of Nations in 2010, Online Harms and Manipulation in 2019, and the well-known Mindspace Report. And in 2015, David wrote a book about the behavioral insights team itself, entitled Inside the Nudge Unit, How Small Changes Can Make a Big Difference. Uh, for those of you that are interested, it's on Amazon at £9.34. Uh, turning to the talk, uh, in today's talk, David will be asking what I would argue is one of the most important questions of the decade. Can behavioural science make the world a better place? Now, I'm not quite sure what topics David will actually cover in the talk, but having seen the film The Social Dilemma and followed politics closely in the recent US election, this question appears to me to be fundamentally important to ask. It touches upon measurement issues that are both politically and emotionally charged and goes to the heart of some fundamental principles that people are willing, people are willing to make a stand on. So I believe that this question and, and getting the right answer really matters to all of us, and it will be hugely interested in, to hear from the person at the heart of the UK's thinking in all of this. So David, uh, we're absolutely delighted that you've agreed to talk to us and very grateful for you, for you taking the time out from your busy schedule. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll, know, I'll, I'll now hand over to you to start your talk and Nick Raish will uh, chair. Thank you. So yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be back. Um, well, back in amongst the academic community even for an hour. Um, and um, what I'm going to try and do is, is take on some of these slightly bigger questions. I also rattled through some sense of the work we've been doing in the last decade or so um, to give a, a sense of it. Um, and I can probably do that. We talked about change, and of course, there's a lot of discussion about change in the last year and what's happening next. Um, but also, actually, trying to take a slightly longer time frame as well and think about what's possible going forward and backwards. Um, and it, I was minded since um, some of you know Chris Black, who's a old friend of mine, in fact, we went to college together um, and asked some time ago if I'd come and do this talk and um, I couldn't resist, but dust off like when we first met, actually probably 84 or 85, um, I found myself, it was a, a, a caricature I'd scribbled of him at that time when I was 18, um, and Chris, I guess about the same. We went interrailing actually around Europe. Um, and of course he looks exactly the same now. Um, I hope he's now learned some of those tunes. Um, and actually to share the pain, that was me back at uh, 85, it's a long time ago actually, it's like 35, 36 years ago. Um, and while kind of doing that is I thought, well, 
one of the things when you're in government is it sometimes it seems like we often would say in the strategy unit days, people often overestimate how much they can achieve in the short term, but they underestimate how much can be achieved in the longer term, um, particularly through the application of good policy and hopefully evidence, which I'll talk about today. What else is going on in 1985? Just remind ourselves, give a sense. You could choose any date, that was pretty arbitrary, right? given Chris. Um, but you know, technology and social issues going on. It was the first, um, it was the year actually when mobile phones started in the UK. Um, it was also a year when um, the miners' strike um, ended, uh, which is of course a very contentious bit of part of British politics. It's striking to think, you know, 142,000 um, mine workers on strike. And now one of the big controversies of the day, should we have one um, new uh, site in order to cope? With, um, you know, coal mining today. Um, the world's clearly moved on in, in respect to that. Um, HIV was uh, raging, was starting to really rage. There was also issues around um, race riots, massive race riots that were going on at the time. Um, some of you may or may not remember or know, um, but that included um, in Birmingham um, and in parts of London. You know, quite a few people were actually killed in some of those riots, including, of course, a, a police officer um, in London. So pretty major issue. And you know, Powell talking about that's what he was talking about when he said River, rivers of blood. Um, inflation was at that time um, over 6%. Um, and the bank rate was, I think, 10-11%. Um, so very different world in that sense, as we'll see. And then so there was this new weird thing called Windows that just came on um, as well at that same time. Um, what kind of public concerns? If we just look at that, some of that period, this is sort of summation of Ipsos Mori data, public concerns for the UK. Um, and it's particularly looking at what were the main public concerns just before the main elections. Um, so it's truncated just before 2010 for reasons of the obvious. Um, but in the 70s, inflation was an absolutely massive issue. It was pretty dominant. Um, and the trade unions, you see them then falling. Unemployment then becomes the dominant issue, particularly through the Thatcher years, including 85, where I was just taking this arbitrary time. Um, by the time you reach the um, 97 election, it gets overtaken only then really by public service concerns, NHS, education, et cetera. Um, and then other issues later on in the Blair period um, around crime and immigration and defense and so on, um, starting to soar and then economy kicking back in. Um, so one of the lessons is some of these issues which seem like they are completely intractable. I mean, unemployment of course is moving a bit, but it's nothing like the level it was there that seem intractable at the time actually do get sorted out over time, partly through deliberate policy action. I mean, unemployment at that period was circa um, 12%, um, now it was 5% today, for example. I thought I might muse on this, a uh, slightly controversial starting point. If we went back another 35 years when Asimov was writing these, um, and there's still quite powerful set of ideas around, um, for those you'll know, I'm assuming in a faculty like yours, many of will know your Asimov very well, probably better than me. And it was premised on the idea, um, those who don't remember it or um, don't know, um, that there was a mathematician, Harry Seldon, who'd figured out that the, a future empire, a galactic empire, was going to descend into chaos. And he figured out there's nothing much he could do about it. So he created these foundations in the so-called Sheldon plan to try and, um, at least if it wasn't, instead of having an interregnum of, 30,000 years, it could at least be reduced to a thousand years and created these two foundations. Anyway, one of them, of course, was sort of hard science and technology, very overt how much you go. But Sheldon had figured out that the hard science alone wasn't going to do it, basically. And so he also creates a so-called second foundation, which is like sort of psychologists who would try and guide and nudge the universe into a better direction. By the way, to be clear, I'm definitely not saying the behavioral insights team, the nudge unit, is supposed to be the second foundation. And more I'm going to try and make the argument about to what extent is it possible to try and nudge individuals, societies onto a path where actually you'll get better outcomes. And in, in particular, also the extent to which you want to blend hard science. Um, I was started my life as a natural science scientist, as did Chris, and that time, all that time ago in Cambridge, um, but with so called soft sciences or psychology. And can we indeed make them harder in some sense, more rigorous? So let's just jump forward. Um, to, of course, a key figure in this area, in our area, has been um, Danny Kahneman, um, who popularized in, think, in Thinking Fast, Thinking thinking Fast and Slow, if you haven't read it, but a very popular book, um, but was already doing his work when Chris and I would have been undergraduates, but his famous 
early studies came out in the 70s, 73, 74. Um, so Danny Kahneman, um, who I remember actually we met during the, when I was in the working for Tony Blair in the strategy unit, um, and we had various early attempts to think about behavior change. But essentially, the idea is that you think primarily through these two simple simplified systems, thinking fast, where actually most of the action happens. So your brain just makes very rapid judgments. It's automatic, intuitive, um, intuitive, effortless, two times two, driving you know, to your normal workplace, um, if you can remember what that was like, um, would be pretty automatic. As opposed to so-called system slow, which is reflective or deliberative, analytical. For most people, 24 times 17, you actually have to scratch your head a bit and figure it out. For learning a new skill, like learning to drive. And one of Danny's remarks in general, um, or insights, was apart from you know, the importance of various kinds of heuristics, was also that, um, oh goodness, sorry, just trying to move um, that environmental effects are very powerful drivers of um, individual behavior, you know, cueing essentially what we do. Um, but just to illustrate, I mean, Danny talks about lots of kinds of mental shortcuts, heuristics, you know, like anchoring effects where you're trying to estimate the probability of something occurring, you think, um, people are afraid of sharks, but not afraid of getting into a car. And why does that make sense? And indeed, a lot of Danny's work was on statisticians and mathematicians to work, try and work out how do they make their estimates and how do other people also make their estimates. But you get lots of parallels in relation to perception um, where we make very rapid judgments. So this so-called you know, famous that dress where many people see this in one set of colors or another. Um, and marriages across the nation put under strain as a result. So some people see it more like um, gold and blue and some, sorry, gold and white, and some people see it more like blue and black. Um, it's basically, you know, in an effortless way, your brain is making judgments about what's going on. And occasionally, because it's using mental shortcuts, in this case, color constancies, it'll get it wrong or have a different view. Or a simplified version of that kind of color constancy illusion is this famous illustration. Um, where if you ask people to look at the sort of central square here, you can see my cursor moving, um, that's uh, for most people looks brown, whereas this one here looks orange. Um, but if we fade out the background, we can see they're basically exactly the same frequencies. Because your brain isn't exactly interested in what frequency it is, it's trying to make a guess as to what color that is likely to be or what kind of thing is it. So if you see a, a large cat with um, kind of dark and orange stripes walking towards you and large teeth. You don't need to sit and pontificate about it. You just need to know you've got to get running. Okay, um, there's lots of, of course, of real world examples all around us. Just take a simple example, one of the great challenges of today um, around how healthy or not we are. And if you ask people in a study like this, what's got more calories? And so we do lots of these randomized control trials. This is not one of ours, by the way, but um, and you say to people, how many calories are in this? You just get people to estimate it. You can just try and do it yourself in your own head. What do you think that is? I could give you an anchoring effect by giving you an arbitrary number, but I won't. Um, and another group of people were given exactly the same uh, image, exactly the same burger, but also with some salad alongside it. Um, I should say the images would have been the same size. And then the question is, how many calories do people estimate? So it turns out identical burger. But when you have some salad alongside it, people's estimates for the total number of calories actually drops, right? So the physicists among you will also know that's unlikely to be true. Um, exactly the same amount of burger plus some other stuff turns out to have more rather than less calories. But as far as people use a mental heuristic, salad looks like it's got less and they sort of average, um, then it, it gives you a kind of error. So, um, I won't go through them all in laborious detail, but there are obviously literally hundreds and hundreds of these kind of heuristics, mental heuristics or shortcuts, which have been documented, which most of the time work really well, but sometimes also make us prone to error or misjudgment. And um, how about building kind of policy as opposed to built on pure economics kind of accounts of the time, um, which have lots of assumptions in them? Why don't we try and work out what people actually do? And in the words of the coalition government in 2010, government will find intelligent ways to encourage, support, and enable people to make better choices for themselves. That was the, in the coalition agreement, and that brought forth the so-called behavioral insights team or the nudge unit alongside some other things which we were doing at the time, which I might just touch on later. 
Um, we had lots of help with our friends across the world, including um, Richard Thaler, another Nobel Prize winner, actually, who got his Nobel Prize in 2015, partly on the back of the Nobel Committee, actually citing the work of the IT, which is pretty cool. Um, so, um, I mentioned I'm not going to talk so much about stuff in other countries, only in passing, but actually, BIT was itself turned into a social purpose company still owned by the British Cabinet Office um, back in 2014, partly because we've got so many requests from other governments and other parts of the world to try and help them with similar approaches. So BIT um, actually has offices now in quite a number of other countries and typically works in about 40 countries each year. Um, and across lots of different areas, right? So it could be very simple things like paying your taxes, um, might not be your most fun thing in the world, but you probably don't want to be paying your neighbors taxes if they don't get around to doing it. Um, economic growth, um, at least I'll touch on that briefly, but confidence issues and what actually makes an economy function well. Health and healthcare, very prominent this last year. And again, I'll touch on some examples around, well, what is it about human behavior that also affects um, health and it's a, a great deal. Saving the planet, education, policing, almost any area you think about it in policy turns out to involve human beings and the weird and wonderful things that we all do. Um, and we combine that with particularly rigorous evaluation and use of randomized controlled trials. And I'll come back to that at the very end. Um, I think you could argue the most important thing that um, an organization like BIT has probably done in the world is helped us smuggle into other areas of practice the scientific method in essence. So what I'm gonna quickly do for remaining time is I'm gonna just use this very simple framework we sometimes use in mnemonic in case you don't want to do a PhD on behavioral science, um, which just is a sort of summary of some of the most prominent effects, East, easy, attractive, social, timely. Um, and then I'm going to um, spend maybe the sort of second half talking more about some of the more advanced applications um, of behavioral science today and where it might take us. So easy. Um, it doesn't seem that complicated by definition, but one of the problems of a lot of um, classical, certainly economic models of human behavior is they presume that we are rational utility maximizers who can do quite complicated calculations. We kind of figure out what's going on in the world and we could figure out what's the best thing to do. Um, but it's just, we, often we can't be bothered really. We'll, we'll take a mental shortcut um, or we'll follow what everyone else is doing. And so one of the implications of it is you need to be incredibly interested in so-called frictional effects. So in the same way that, um, take a physics problem, you might say, um, if I impart a certain amount of force into this object and push it across a table, ignoring friction, what will happen kind of thing, right? Which is fine, except in the real world, friction turns out to be really important <laughs> um, quite often. And it certainly is true psychologically too. So this image in the background is the idea of, if you're gonna put down pathways, rather than architects have learned over the years often, um, is that you, you just, you, you don't put down a path first of all, you see where people walk so-called paths of desire, and then you put the pathway down the stone afterwards rather than before. That'd be a very simple example. And the most famous example, in many ways, the poster child for behavioral science and policy in, in the last decade has been so-called pensions enrollment, auto-enrollment. And why is this important, just to dwell on it for a second, is that on both sides of the Atlantic, we have been spending billions, in fact, continue to do so, more than 20 to 30 billion in the UK alone, on essentially tax subsidies to encourage people to save more for their old age. I think about how the world has changed, plan ahead, you know. Um, but despite these very substantial payments, um, I mean, in essence, they're not very effective. So a totally brilliant economist, Raj Shetty, attempted some estimates as using Danish data, but um, what was the cost effectiveness of each pound or dollar that you spent to subsidize or encourage people to, um, you know, to, to save? And his estimate was basically for every pound, you get a penny of extra saving. It's unbelievably ineffective in that sense. In contrast, the change that's made in 2012 in the UK um, was to change the defaults. So is it really that Anglo-Saxons hate saving or is it just that we couldn't be bothered to fill in a piece of paper? Um, guess what it turns out to be. So auto-enrollment flips from a situation where instead of you having to opt into your pension provide, um, uh, you know, saving basically, um, you still have the choice, but it's now if you don't want to be a part of the scheme, you opt out. So for, you know, university pension scheme, whatever, it would be the same in principle would apply. And what difference does it make? Well, it turns out to be absolutely huge difference. 
And if you look at it within individual cohorts, basically for people who are offered the um, auto enrollment on both sides of the Atlantic, it's pretty much identical. For eligible workers, about 91% of people stick with the default. And by the way, a majority of the, the 9% who opt out still say they favor it being set in that way. So what's the consequence of all that? Well, basically, um, since 2012, there's about an extra more than 10 million extra people who are saving for pensions because of a change in the default. Um, and you compare the efficacy of that versus these extraordinary huge um, tax subsidies, you realize, oh my goodness, we better get interested in human behavior. There's another cut on the same. Um, so defaults matter in lots and lots of ways. Actually, here's another an example about food. I'll use a few as we go along, um, public health issues. What do most people choose when presented with a choice like that? They tend to choose the middle option, basically. Um, in this case, that gives you a 45 calorie consumption. Um, you know, typically 80% or something like that will be quite common. So in this experiment, what happens is, as in commercial experience, um, the bottom category is dropped and the, the, the top one is an extra one added on. And by the way, if you would ask people before, why do you choose the middle one? They'll say, oh, well, you know, the small ones are not too quite, kind of Goldilocks, you need a little bit too little and the big one's too much. But what happens if you then change the actual um, amounts that are available? And then what happens on the next day? You get a very significant increase in the number of people who basically, they continue essentially to choose the middle category. So you get a lot of calorific increase because people carry on actually with the strategy of choose the middle, the Goldilocks option, not the actual size. In fact, one of the canons of um, perceptual psychology is that people do most things in terms of relativities. And that's true um, in a lot of life. So you make it easy. Why don't you make it easy and say, well, make the regular like the default click and put it in the middle rather than the um, one end on your menu. And one kind of, I don't want to spend lots of time on COVID, but I will mention one or two things. One of the really striking things about, um, again, rational econs, you think, you know, for things like smoking, whatever, it's just like, I remember in fact, smoking, a good example, talking to a health advisor years ago. Um, and we were doing work on additional incentives to help people quit smoking. And this guy, Paul Cor Corrigan, his name was a very, very powerful figure advisor at that time to the health secretary and then later the prime minister. Um, it's like, what possible more incentive can you need to quit smoking? If you don't quit, it's probably going to kill you. Like, what, what are we going to have that's a bigger incentive than that? But it turns out with human beings, that's actually really important. Here's a COVID recent example. When you look at people who are not planning to take up the vaccine, um, one of the biggest issues is just, well, it will take 30 minutes to travel to and from. You know, if they think it'll take them a while to get there, that is an absolutely major block for people. So before you get concerned with lots of more complex aspects of vaccine hesitancy, you want to be really concerned with, can we just take away all the frictions and make it as easy as possible, right? And then actually that'll, that'll do quite a lot of your heavy lifting quite often. So make it easy turns out to be really key. What a surprise. Um, and we come back to other examples which use technology to, to enable that, of course, maybe later on. Um, attractive, I mean, what makes it attractive? There's two elements to it psychologically. First of all, is like what attracts your attention given there's lots of else going on in the world, but also what in a deeper sense is attractive or appealing. So calling out someone's name or using a personalization in some way would be an example. Or even this image behind this slide is actually a, quite a nice example. It was an organization we worked with in Australia called Vic Health, um, basically supports public health. And this is Southern Cross Station. Um, and someone had the idea, it wasn't our intervention, channel, but we did later reanalyze it to see the effect size. Um, and you can just sort of see at the edge of the image, there are these sort of escalators, and then there's this giant staircase. But what happens, a lot of people take the escalators. So adding the image, does it change people's behavior? And the answer is yes, it does. During rush hour, having the extra image, this image there, increased the number of people taking the steps by about 25%. And in, um, outside of rush hour, more than doubles the number of people who take the steps, just because they look nice, right? Um, <laughs> more prosaic everyday examples of this is how you can try and tune and improve an image to make it more likely to be noticed and understood. So here's one from COVID. Um, you mentioned, I think, uh, Peter, right at the beginning, um, hand washing, a very simple application. But if you're designing a poster, how do you make it cut through? And here's an illustration. So this just shows you behind the scenes how this evolved by running multiple trials, online trials with several thousand people. Um, the original image looks like this. It's got the NHS brand. It's got the two 
you know, sections, etc. It's got a load of these things, and you can see what that image is, but it's, it's actually a load of hands um, designed by the creatives um, holding on. Um, uh, but a lot of people can quite work out what it is, and sometimes actually images distract. It then goes these iterations, and you can see the text starts to get bigger. What's the main message? Well, can we just write that bigger? And then it gets stripped down still further and again until you see the sort of the last image, which was the public form. So this essentially had gone through, if you like, lab tests to several thousand people to work out if you're shown this for a few seconds, can you remember the main messages or can you not? Um, and it's not that complicated in the end. What it does is you can sort of see it becomes just much more stripped down and simplified um, with a main message right there in your face, whether or not you want to sing um, happy birthday. And even the image itself has become stripped down and simpler, you'll notice underneath it. Um, you know, well, that's fine. You wash your hands. Could we save the planet? I mean, one of the biggest things for most people that can do to um, reduce their carbon footprint and with knock on consequences is to eat less red meat. And then interesting, quite specific challenge, you know, as you've got COP26 coming up and all the rest of it is, well, how do you do that? So how do you, how do you describe a vegetarian breakfast? Um, anyway, basically it turns out calling it vegetarian or meat free is not particularly attractive to a lot of people. Um, on the other hand, if you call it something else, you know, like feel, good, feel grown, if you call it feel grown as opposed to meat free or um, vegetarian, roughly you'll double the number of people who seem to choose it as a menu option. Um, so a bit crazy, but actually that's a very big difference. And particularly if that means that um, producers and restaurants start saying, oh, in which case it's worth putting it on the menu. Um, some of them can also be quite large. And I'll just touch on something we sometimes call the double nudge, where you try and move one group to knock on. It's like a kind of oblique impacts where you're knocking one ball to you know, knock another. In this case, we want to try and make the labor market more flexible. Um, this is just pre-COVID when this kicked off to give a sense of it. Um, it's also one of the largest social policy trials ever run. Um, it's crazy experimental design, but literally, I can't remember the numbers, between 10 to 20, million people have been exposed to this intervention. And what it does is we, we use, we work with Indeed, which is the world's biggest job boards, basically. Or, um, and we said, can we prompt um, firms when they're putting up a job advert, there's some firm, but I don't think about what it is. So could it be done flexibly? And most firms actually, and heads of HR say, so actually it would be possible to do this on a flexible basis, you know, compressed hours or whatever it would be. So we said, well, why don't you, can we encourage you, essentially we change the choice architecture to prompt firms to include, they have an option now to click on it about um, flexible working options available, you know, compressed hours, job share, whatever it would be, right? So we are nudging the firms to make the change. Um, and the question is, does it make a difference, right? Well, it does. So first of all, how many firms, when we just gently prod them and say, you know, we change the choice architecture, um, start advertising their jobs as being flexible. Well, actually it's quite a significant increase. By the way, look at the end, there's more than 200,000 firms um, in this trial. So it's 20% increase in the number of firms who then advertise jobs or jobs that have been advertised as being um, flexible working as possible. I should explain one of the major reasons why this is important is because there's lots of groups in society women returning um, to work, or indeed actually either parents returning to work or lots of groups who've got caring responsibilities, who it makes it much, much easier for them to access the labor market if flexible working is available. So it has very big equality impacts, if you like. What does it do for the applications? That's also interesting to look at. Well, this is the average number of applications for the jobs. Remember, it's a randomized controlled trial where there's no flexible working. For ones where the, the for prompt and, you know, is brought into there, um, essentially flexible working is then mentioned, you get a 30% increase in the number of applicants. So it does really increase the number of applications. In fact, it increases applications from both men and women, by the way. So it's a beautiful example of a double nudge. And one of these ideas I'm trying to use, which is that, um, like I know Lancaster's famous for space science, right? Actually, is one of the points, if you're trying to stop some meteor crashing into the earth, it's really difficult to do doing it late. Whereas if you could apply the force very early on, and you just kind of nudge the arc and then and hopefully it'll miss planet Earth and we're all going to survive. So some of the stuff is kind of the equivalent. You're doing something a bit upstream. It's what seems like a modest intervention. But in fact, in this case, it's changing the character of the labor market in quite an important way. 
Um, social, well, we are really influenced by what other people are doing. Um, so reciprocity and so on and so on, active commitments, I won't go through all the list. Um, this actually is one of the very famous early trials that was done by the Behavioral Insights team, since replicated in many countries um, across the world. Um, and it's sometimes an absolutely massive scar. Some of these trials, in fact, involving more than 10 million people at a time. Anyway, this is the original simple version, but it illustrates the points pretty well. And this was for people who are late paying their tax. And we tried adding one line and doing it as a randomized control trial, which is just tell people something which is true. Nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time. And this is being written to people who are late paying their tax, I should explain. And the question is, does it make a difference for the payment rate? Well, the answer is it does. Um, there's the control group. Um, and you can see 33% roughly um, pay without any further prompt from HMRC. But if you start adding in these extra lines, well, you get improvements. Um, so that was um, nine out of 10 people, I should say. That's nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time. This is most people in your local area because you're particularly influenced by people who are like you, such as in your own area, even better. This is you're one of the few yet to pay. Um, and this is most people in your area pay and you're one of the few yet to do so. You're now 39%. Now that might not seem a big deal, but that's, you know, that five kind of odd four or five percentage point is a 15% increase in the payment rate without any further prompt. And if you are HMRC and you are in the business of collecting billions of revenue, this is a really big deal. It was also one of the first randomized controls they ever did, which was very controversial inside the machine, but helped to persuade the revenue that in fact it should be doing this. And it now, now does it um, quite extensive scale. Um, there are other kind of social comparisons. So here's one to try and save the planet. If that's something you want to do, a famous early example in, by, done by Opower, um, it, which was just to give people feedback about their energy use relative to their neighbors. Um, and so you see yourself and you see all neighbors in particular, you see yourself relative to your more efficient, 25% more efficient neighbors. And does it make a difference if you send people this information? It does. It typically gives you around about, you know, two or 3% on a good day, reduction in energy use. Um, and it's also been studied in enormous detail. Like I should say more than 50 million people have been exposed to this kind of intervention across the world. Um, where what happens if you stop doing it and you see that almost precisely half the effect remains, partly because people make structural changes to their homes and half it is driven by going around like, oh my God, I can't believe you kept leaving the lights on, going switching them off. So um, half that fades out and half sticks. And one more, um, a bit more complicated, one of the classic examples that Obama uses about how the hell can you pass a law to make a kid concentrate in class? Pretty hard to do that. Um, and so we were wrestling this, and this is particularly, you might remember a couple of years ago, a few years ago, there was a change in Britain, which was that if you, if you failed your maths and English at um, 16, you were required to retake. So FE colleges suddenly found themselves with loads of these 16, 17 year olds who are having to retake their maths and English. You know, I didn't enjoy it much the first time around. And the question is, what could we do to help on that? So I'm sorry it's not more interactive. I'd love to ask you. For those of you who've got teenage kids, you might think about, you know, when you say, hey, how was your day at school? How was your day at college today? You know, most of you get like, mm, fine, whatever. Um, and it's quite hard as a parent to engage in that. You know, so, so if your kid said, oh, nothing special, really, you'd be very impressed. That would be pretty much a whole sentence. So what does a parent do to reinforce that behavior? It's quite hard. For them to do something. So the idea in this was to recruit kids and say, you know, um, to explain the design, basically, would you like to take part in this program? It involves giving more feedback. Um, you can choose two people who we will then will get texts about what's going on in college. So you're basically saying to a young person, hey, sign up here and we'll send these texts so that either your parent or your brother or whoever you choose can hassle you more, right? By the way, so not all kids want to do that. Um, so if you do sign up, if a kid sign up, then what happens is that, you know, texts like this start to flow through. Like, you know, hey, Alice, please check in with James. Um, ask me started reading Hunger Games. We discussed in GCSE English next week. Thanks. And then sometimes people text back or whatever. But basically, it's giving information. So you can now have a different conversation with your 16-year-old, right? It's like, oh, so you're reading Hunger Games. Oh, who's your favorite character? Yeah, I've got to get started on that. Um, okay, well, don't forget to read a few chapters before next week week's class. So you can have a different kind of engagement, which is specific. That was the idea. 
Um, and the question is, would it make a difference? And this is what we found for GCSE students. These are GCSE students who are retaking, so their pass rates are pretty low, by the way, to bear in mind. So first of all, we have to compare those who didn't opt in with those who did opt in, right? Because if the kids who opt in might not be typical. So we then take the ones who um, opt in only, and we then randomize them. And so some of them get controlled treatment, not very much, it's basic information or whatever. But some of them then get this treatment I just showed you. And the question is, what does it do to their pass rates? Well, as you can see from the strap line, it increased by about 30%, which is a really big deal, right? By giving this extra feedback. There was also a lovely aspect. We asked the kids towards the end of the program, do you want to carry on getting these texts and prompt? And the vast majority of them, particularly from more disadvantaged backgrounds, tend to say, yes, actually, can you carry on with the text and prompt? So it's actually being used now in quite a few FE colleges across Britain. So that was social, mobilizing social network. Um, the last one on the kind of the big four, if you like, is timely. So if you want to change people's behavior, you particularly want to look out for when people's behavior is disruptive. As I'm sure it immediately occurred to you, we have just gone through the mother of all behavioral disruptions. You know, people are working from home, exercising differently, cooking more, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so why? It's because a lot of behavior is habit-based. So when those habits are disrupted is your best moment to try and either individually, by the way, to change your own habits um, or collectively to try and change habits. Um, this image actually on the background of this slide, it looks like a heartbeat, is Google searches using the word diet. You can see it looks like a literally a perfect heartbeat, and that's annual. And if you can guess when this is, you probably can for most of you, given your human beings. Um, this is uh, basically Christmas going down here, right? <laughs> and then this is New Year. Oh my God, I can't get in my clothes anymore in January. Um, and so it goes away. You actually, by the way, often get a secondary peak here. You can guess when that is. That's before summer holidays. I'm going to be going on a beach. Oh my God. Diet. Um, okay, timely moments. So here's an example. Um, it's really important for a lot of technology um, adoption. You're running out a cycle scheme or something, and the question is, what should you do and how do you get people to adopt it? Well, you ideally, again, if you go with this logic, you're looking for moments when the behavior is disrupted. Now, introducing the, the bike scheme itself could be a disruption, but who should you prompt and whatever? And this compares the effectiveness of you know, people who sign up, either because there's a new station in their neighborhood, this is kind of responding basically to email signups, so the numbers are tiny, of course, mass. But if you pick out the people who are the new movers, so they've moved within the previous three months, they are dramatically more likely to sign up. And why is that? It's because their behavior has been disrupted and they haven't settled into a new sort of, if you like, habit-based commute. So you want to try and figure out when those moments of disruption are and do something about it. That'd be good, hopefully. Um, here's just one example um, about helping people to, to plan. This is for job seekers, um, relevant to unemployment I mentioned at the beginning. So across a number of countries, we've used something called active welfare policy, which is basically you, you prompt people to actively search for work. And there's lots of evidence it's a good thing to do. But our whole system over 30 odd years have been basically built for anyone who's ever gone into a job center is you get asked to prove which jobs are you looking for? You know, can you show me which three jobs, you know, paper, how do you go about it? It's a bit like being a kind of slight policeman in a, in a job center. But you're asking people about what they did last week rather than what we thought having studied it, it might be better to ask people about what you can do next week. So this is interesting, because if you're an economist, you always think, well, wait a minute, we should ask them about what they did last week, and then we should punish them, because that's a sanction. But from a psychological point of view, often the issue is, is, is a bit messier than that. And what you want to do is around particularly what's called implementation intention. If you encourage people to plan ahead, they're more likely to do something. So we managed to persuade a number of job centers. In fact, I'm showing you the data. It's a series of trials on this. is what's called a step wedge design done across a region in the UK, where instead of saying, what jobs did you look for last week? We had said, so if it was Peter, for example, who just did the introduction, he was coming into job center and say, hey, Peter, so what kind of work are you looking for? And he say, well, I want to be a university lecturer. Actually, I'd like to be a vice chancellor now, um, whatever it is. Um, so, okay, well, you're pretty busy. Let's think about next week. How are you going to go about this? Like, how are you going to go find out this job to be a vice chancellor somewhere? So you might think, well, actually, a lot of these things you get through social networks. Good point. That's right, Peter. How are you going to go about doing it? So you'd say, well, when's a good time? You'd encourage people to think about how you're going to do it and when you're going to do it. Well, I'll do it after on Wednesday 
after I drop the kids off or whatever it be. So you encourage people to think um, ahead, basically. But you drop some of the kind of classical san sanctions. Does it make a difference? So this is step wedge design. So this is done across a big region. And the control group gets the standard treatment. Then the treatment gets, this is the number of people um, who are basically back in work at 13 weeks. Now that again might look, what, a couple of percentage points? That is huge. That is huge. Two and a half million people, even pre-COVID, go through JCP every, um, every year. And on average, to turn it into different numbers, this is between people get back to work between two and four days faster, right? So that is huge. It is like hundreds of millions of value and so on and so on. And I haven't got time to go into it, but it also, it's just nicer. People prefer it. There's a much more human interaction that occurs as well. So this has now been replicated in five other countries um, across the world. And we typically see effect sizes. This is a step word incorporates some other things, but you know, between sort of two to 5% improvement in the number of people back at work in that sort of two to three month period by um, flipping it around this way. So I've gone through, as it were, some of the 101. I'm going to quickly rattle through some slightly more advanced examples in the remaining bit of time, those who are still with me. Um, so a lot of issues look like this. This is a, when you're a policymaker, this is a causal map, a famous one, actually, done for obesity, which I've used as a bit of a theme through today, given it's one of the big issues in the world right now. Um, and it was a causal map of the drivers behind obesity. So it's really complicated. And a lot of policymakers in different parts of the system all look at it like advertising, like, oh, it's so complicated. There's nothing I can do about this. It's just too complex, too complex a system. My bit is only this bit. The alternative is if you can find a tipping point where it's going to move the equilibrium, then maybe you can actually change the whole system in some significant way. So I haven't had time to go through all the directions, but the sugar levy or sugar tax in drinks, which we worked on and introduced a few years ago, is an illustration of those. So you go into a supermarket, I suppose you're gonna choose some lemonade or whatever it is. For years and years, it says on it how much sugar it is, but most people never read those labels, right? So if we take, you know, if we'd asked you, um, say five years ago or even now, how much sugar is there in different lemonades? Let's suppose you're a lemonade drinker. Now I've just picked them out. There's seven up. This is circa 2014. Um, and you can see seven up. It's got a lot more sugar in it than Sprite or Schweppes, or actually right at the bottom, Tesco lemonade has a lot less sugar still. But most consumers are quite unaware of this. So we test in various kinds of ways, moving behavior by changing positions and labeling all the rest of it. But we're also trying to estimate what's called the elasticity to work out how big a price move would mean someone would actually, even a small percentage of people would shift over, say circa 10%. So we then basically design the levy around this. And it's all driven by another thing, I haven't got time to go into, but basically substitutions you often look for what's the alternative behavior. So you don't need to move very many consumers and you can start to stabilize an equilibrium. So the sugar levy is, was designed with, um, you can see there's a sort of natural stepping down. This is kind of drinks which have got all sugar in them. And these are often low sugar variations, you know, aspartame or whatever in there. And these are sometimes blended like Coke. This would be Coke up here and this would be Coke uh, Life, whatever it's called. Um, and then this would be Diet Coke down right here. So the levy is designed to do this. Um, and so what does it do? Well, what it, it does is it moves a small number of marginal consumers, but most people don't change their behavior very much. It's getting, but it's enough to change retailer stocking decisions, which in turn drives reformulation, which is exactly what we see. So that's what happens with lemonade within 18 months to two years of the sugar levy kicking in. And there's some more drug uh, drinks coming in. And typically you see about 45 million kilograms of sugar removed every year. By 2018, we're at 30% reduction in sugar. But by the way, overall sales may being maintained or even increasing. So it's substituting, which is a much better way to achieve behavior change um, overall. And now I think the most recent data, I'm not sure it's out or not, is close to 40% reductions in sugar. It's absolutely enormous. And for your average 15 year old, who's getting about 15, you know, 10 to 15% of their calories are coming from um, carbonated drinks. This is a very, very big deal indeed. But the beauty of it is for most consumers, they don't have to do very much because the reformulation is occurring, whether they notice it or not, driven by markets being tilted. So it's what we call deshrouding markets sometimes, one of those very powerful forces, which is that can you inform them to, to change it and then to get the markets themselves to then to try and um, drive stuff. So quite often you're in a situation where only one attribute is revealed. And if you can reveal other ones, you can change it. 
So here's a good one for, again, talking about 15 year old kids or probably 12 year old kids. A beautiful piece of work um, done actually by um, the Royal Society of Public Health, which has asked 15 year olds, running with my 15 year old theme here for a second, um, what is the impacts of different kinds of social media um, on your emotional mood, your sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows pretty clearly YouTube, you know, it's not great for your sleep because you just keep looking through, but that's true for nearly all of them by design. Um, but it doesn't basically make you feel like crap. Whereas number five, Instagram, certainly that time, it's pretty bad emotional impacts that it has on or had on 15 year olds. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, when a parent buys the kid their phone, it's like, here's your new smartphone, congratulations. Can we just agree one thing? Why don't you use YouTube instead of Instagram, right? And we're trying to do that to drive and change the market force. And this is true in lots of areas where you can kind of create feedback loops to tilt a market so it starts to compete on some other dimension, particularly if you make it easy and you make it available at the point of purchase. And there are fancier things, which I'll at least touch on. One of the really exciting areas is combining it with machine learning in a number of areas. Um, I didn't go into it, but we've done lots of interventions with GPs and medics to try and, um, you know, get them to reduce their antibiotic prescriptions or various other things. And one of the challenges in our regulators is we try to identify who's a good or a bad, um, you know, in this case, a GP or whatever. So, so there's, um, of course, most GPs are great, but they, they have this regulator kind of a, or inspector identify so-called um, about 4% or so of so-called inadequate for those problems. And they have an army of several thousand inspectors who try and do this. And the question is, could you use machine learning to take to get all the other kinds of data, including the informal feedback, which is often left on websites by people to identify the GPs or so-called inadequate? And this is what the model looks like. So if the CQC basically did their inspections by random, right, as a 20% sample, they get 20% of the inadequates, um, GPs. They do concentrate their efforts somewhat. It turns out if you look at their how they do it and this is our simulation of what we think they do so for the 20 percent of checking of gps they get about 30, just over 30 percent the machine learning model which combines prescription data feedback local population characteristics etc can on that same threshold pick up 95 percent of inadequate gps right so you could use that to say well great, we don't need so many inspectors anymore. You could try and identify those GPs much earlier and then give them feedback about what they're doing differently compared to others and how they might improve their prescription behavior or whatever it would be. Pretty cool, really. You sort of marry on the behavioral techniques with much better targeting. The last couple of things, let me just draw out. I've talked about lots of relatively modest things or market behavior, but there's lots of really important issues, which is what actually makes societies work or not, is whether we get on with each other. So one of our big in-house challenges is, you know, well, let's take a real example. Um, in the war, in the world, typically today, every you know, last couple of decades, about two wars start every year, and the average cost, if you want to crassly calculate its economic cost, is circa a hundred billion dollars. Wouldn't it be neat to try and stop a couple of wars occurring? Most of them are reignition, but certainly more than half of them are reignition of previous conflicts. Um, a more general kind of if you like everyday example of this is: Do you think other people can be trusted? So it's a really good, simple measure of a society in a number of ways. The UK is mid-table. This, this graph shows you basically levels of social trust. Do you think other people can be trusted? In, um, yes, or can't be too careful. In the um, kind of 1980s versus in some of the more recent data. In fact, we're just waiting for the most recent to come back. Um, it's the World Value Survey. Um, you can see the Anglo-Saxons, actually they're not in there, but um, there's Britain or whatever. We've been drifting. We're mid-table, but drifting towards lower social trust. There are lots of countries down here, like in lots of Latin America and, and Africa, are sort of less than 10% of people would say most others could be trusted. It's incredibly consequential. Versus up here, you've got some of the Nordics, like Norway or Netherlands. Now, they're already pretty high social trust, but they've been drifting towards even more so. So you get you know, better than 70% of people saying sometimes most others can be trusted. Why is that consequential? Social trust is so important for so many variables, including economic growth and crime and all the rest of it. Um, educational attainment and performance of government. Like, why would you pay your taxes? Why would you go and get a vaccine if you didn't trust everyone else to do the same? Right? It's really important. In fact, more important than your trust in government is your trust in your fellow citizen. So we've been working on interventions to see well, what can you do to boost and increase social trust, either at individual or collective level, which I won't go into, but you can see why it might be pretty important. And then finally, 
even if you didn't care about any of the behavioral science, as Peter mentioned in the beginning, let's do a day a week still as, as national advisor on what works, which is basically just trying to get different parts of government to be empirical. So this screenshot is simply from something called the Educational Endowment Foundation, which we set up in 2011, which has been running trials and tests in schools. More than one, one and a half million UK kids have taken part in randomized controlled trials in the last decade in Britain, trying to figure out what's a better way of teaching maths or whatever it would be. And it also shows lots of things that, you know, like aspiration interventions. Everyone likes it, you know. Oh. If only you could meet some fantastic academics at Lancaster University, you'd work harder in class. Sadly, that's generally doesn't seem to be true. On the other hand, you know, giving kids feedback about their homework is highly effective and not very expensive. All right, in conclusion, I've rattled through lots of stuff, but I hope I've given you a glimpse into our world. I do want to cut back to Asimov. Um, and um, what I guess, sorry, COVID has been one of the most powerful illustrations of this, right? If you think about it and you unpack it, of course, a lot of it is about the amazing science that has gone into producing the vaccines. It's really extraordinary and brilliant and impressive. But if you go, if you look over the cycle, just loads of it has always been behavioral. So first of all, the first line of defense, long before you got vaccines, you're trying to get people to wash their hands, right? Maintain higher distance, hands face space. Um, wear masks, of course, and do these things which seem rather strange. So your first line of defense is essentially pl classic public health issues um, or responses, which are highly behavioral. How do you persuade people to do this? Even your second line of defense is you start to create testing systems and so on. And then we figure out, uh, you know, Chris Black, oh my God, he's got COVID. We've got to tell him to stay home. Will he stay home? Will he comply? How do you make people comply? You know, are you better off to send them a text or should you call them up? Do you have to use money and how much money? Right? These are really important behavioral questions because if people who've got COVID don't stay home, you are really in trouble very fast. And even when you get to vaccines, you still got the question of, if you've got the best vaccine in the world, if you've got a situation as we see in France today, for example, with very high levels of so-called vaccine hesitancy, your vaccine is no good if it's in no one's arms. And that's true in lots of areas. I mean, we did interventions on tuberculosis, killed more than a million people a year. Um, one of the major issues why it continues to kill people, even though it's been treatment since the 1940s, is because people don't persist with the treatment because they feel better and they stop taking it. Um, okay, I touched on the issues then. What are the issues today? I mean, coronavirus, of course, absolutely. Um, that will doubtless, and we already see it in the numbers dropping now fast. Brexit concerns falling. Um, even in this you know, beginning of the year, they were starting to drop away. On the other hand, economic concerns are going to surge. We've got healthcare, public health issues, inequality and disadvantage, absolutely. Unemployment is going to probably come up again, hopefully not too much. What about saving the planet? That's a good idea. What about all the things that aren't even on public concern, but they will be if they go wrong? So I mentioned wars and conflict. They are a huge issue in the world. And what breaks a lot of countries and places is that people fall out with each other. Right? Ideally, we want to stop that happening before it happens. Pretty behavioral. And ideally, we would even help people to, you know, it's not for us to tell kids what to do or your students, right? But can you disrupt, can you inform them? And one of the really fascinating things about um, behavioral science, contemporary behavioral science, which we also worked on over the last decade, is to try and inform people about, well, actually what does make you happy? Um, and indeed the ONS measures, the four well-being measures, which we brought into being from 2012, were to ask regularly, you know, what is it, you know, what are people's levels of life satisfaction and were they happy in the last few days or anxious? Or do they think the things they're doing are worthwhile? Because if you're trying to decide after you leave Lancaster or whatever, what shall I do with my life? Wouldn't it be quite good not only to see earnings, but to see, for example, people like me, how happy are they doing these different kinds of occupations? Of course, you've got some issues about, you know, what's in this data or not, but the basic gist of it. So I don't know, compare, um, look, um, legal professionals actually on average earn a bit more than medical practitioners, but medical practitioners have significantly higher life satisfaction. That shouldn't be the only factor, but it might affect some of your choices and what you do in life, right? Could we inform people? And one of the interesting things about biases is they also apply to our own judgments, even of well-being. We tend to misremember what made us happy. We tend to mispredict what which will make us happy. Can we reveal that to help people and overall help society reach a better equilibrium? So a lot of people had thought the nudge unit was a bit of a joke. I mean, we weren't sure if it would work at all ourselves back in 2010. Um, it turns on now, by 2018, there were more than 200 copycat units um, across governments across the world. Um, and that number has continued to rise. 
partly because it's just a very, very powerful set of tools, which does raise lots of other issues too, which maybe we'll get into in the discussion. But if you have nothing else from this, I, I do think and I hope we look forward 35 years as opposed to back 35 years when Chris and I were 18 year olds. Um, we'll look back and just think, you know, our kids or our grandchildren will think, oh my God, what were you doing, guys? What a, what a strange model you had of human behavior when you were trying to make the world a better place. You know, of course you want a more sophisticated behavior, uh, behavioral model. And also, why wouldn't you be empirical? Because the dirty truth is huge swathes of what we do in governments across the world and in a lot of life, frankly, was never tested in a systematic way. So it's come back to that kind of closing thought, which is the most useful thing, in fact, is to bring the scientific method into other areas, right? And that kind of empiricism um, and imagine what's possible if we do that to scale. So thank you, I'll stop there. I probably took a little bit too long.